Hello, travelers, and welcome to Adventures in Myth and History. In the late 20th century, a movement to credit the Iroquois great law of peace with a direct link to the creation of the Republic, known as the United States, made substantial inroads into revising American history. This movement, lacking any documentary evidence of a connection between the great law and our founding documents, resorted to playing the race card and launching personal attacks against historians who, on their part, stubbornly refused to even consider these new perspectives on how the founders came up with the Constitution. I would have likely left this debate alone, but while reading Captivating History's book, Native American History, I came across the author's assertion that Benjamin Franklin used the great law of peace, which the author calls the Constitution of Hiawatha, and no other resource I've seen calls it that, as the model for the Articles of Confederation, the first document that united the colonies. The author also asserts that Franklin's articles were adopted in 1777. First, Franklin's draft articles were not even considered by the Continental Congress, and Franklin was not on the committee assigned to write the Articles of Confederation. Second, the author provided no proof for the claims that the Iroquois are responsible for how the United States government was structured. For these reasons, I decided to do my own research. Although no documentary evidence exists that the founders used the great law of peace as a model, the role of cultural syncretism, the blending of two distinct cultures that creates a new custom, idea, or practice, and the regular interactions between the founders and the Iroquois leadership certainly made borrowing from the Iroquois pa plausible. The question is, to what extent did the great law of peace influence the founders? With no evidence of the discussion of the great law of peace in the documents that recorded the creation of the Articles of Confederation of the U.S. Constitution, any specific claim to the amount of influence would be, well, a scientific wild guess. Comparing the great law to the Articles of Confederation, and then to the Constitution, it became clear that there was some influence early in the process of forming the United States. However, the effects of that influence were only superficial, with a high level of uncertainty regarding how affected the founders were by the great law. It also became clear that finding any influence of the great law on the Constitution is only possible when taking a very high look at function, ignoring the details and alternative possibilities for why the Constitution was constructed as it was. In this video, I walk through the great law of peace and how we believe the Iroquois Confederation, or League, operated at a high level. We also look at the interactions between the Founders and the Iroquois and compare the Great Law to the Albany Plan of Union, the Articles of Confederation, and the Constitution. As with all my videos, I present what we know and provide my contingent conclusions, conclusions that are open to change as more information arises. But I rely on you to come up with your own decisions, which I hope you'll share in the comments. During the Revolution, the Second Continental Congress needed stronger ties between the colonies, connections that would help strengthen their efforts against the Crown, and later serve as a way to ensure cooperation. In June of 1776, Congress tasked a committee to draw up a Confederation document. These minutes from the meeting, archived in the Library of Congress, confirm this. This document shows the members of the committee. Note that Benjamin Franklin is not on it. This is an important point given that Franklin's relationship with the Iroquois and his drafting of an earlier document, the Albany Plan, are used as evidence that the articles were copied from the Great Law of Peace. Although not on the committee, Franklin submitted an Articles of Confederation draft in July 1775. Congress didn't consider it. Also in 1775, Silas Dean of Connecticut offered his version of a set of Confederation articles, followed by still another draft from the Connecticut delegation that was probably 
a revised version of Dean's. None of these contributed significantly to the one presented to Congress in June 1776 that was written by John Dickinson, the chairman of the Articles of Confederation Committee. After consideration, debate, and revision, Congress approved Dickinson's version in November 1777 and then submitted it to the colonies for approval. That was the process of creating the Articles of Confederation. So how much did the Iroquois Great Law influence its form and content? The challenge facing the committee was the form of government needed. Unlike other democracies and republics like Rome and Athens, the colonies were a group of independent governments that wanted to retain as much of their independence as possible. Only one other successful confederation existed at the time, the Swiss Confederation. While there is no evidence that any European government, before or contemporary with the founders, was used as a model, some were likely considered during the process. However, we don't know to what extent they affected the final articles. Two other possible influences were the Great Law and the Albany Plan. I'll avoid the legend leading up to the adoption of the Great Law of Peace. That information is available in the bibliography in the video description. What I will discuss is the reason for the law and how it worked. The Great Law created a confederation, or league, established in about 1570 CE and lasting in its entire sixth nation state until about 1784 CE. Some claim the Confederation began in the early 12th century CE, but I use a more commonly accepted date range. The Confederacy originally consisted of five Native American nations, the Onondaga, Mohawk, Seneca, Oneida, and Cayuga. These nations, located in the woodlands of what would become New York State, were later joined by the Tuscarora. The purpose of the Great Law was to stop the frequent violence between the nations. It was a peace document, not an agreement designed for a common defense, although it also served that purpose. Because a form of the Iroquois Confederacy still exists today, I will use the present tense when discussing how their government works. Each nation consists of matriarchal clans, clans led by a clan mother, The position of clan mother is hereditary. Each clan appoints a council lord, approved by both the clan women and men, who is installed by the grand council. Note that not all nations have the same number of clans, with the Onondaga having the most at 14 and the Cayuga with at least 8. The Onondaga are the keepers of the council fire. In practice, This means they convene the council when something they believe is of significant enough importance comes before them. When a council meeting is needed, the Onondaga send runners to the other nations notifying their council lords that their presence is required. Once the council is assembled, the fire keepers, the Onondaga, light the council fire and announce the subject for discussion. The Mohawk lords are the leaders of the Confederacy. During the upcoming discussion and voting process, the Mohawk can veto any measures passed. All Mohawk lords must be present when issues are decided. Otherwise, any decisions are illegal. In addition to the Mohawk lord attendance requirement, every Onondaga lord must also be present. If a lord cannot attend the council, he must be represented by a deputy. A speaker is appointed for the day and must be from the Mohawk, Onondaga, or Seneca Nation. Although the Tuscarora were admitted to the Confederation, they had no vote in council. If they have something important to convey, they must do do so through the Cayuga Lords. Deliberation on an issue begins by passing it to the Elder Brothers, the Mohawk and Seneca, Seneca Lords. The Elder Brothers discuss and decide on the issue. If they unanimously agree on a question, they report their decision to the younger brothers, the Oneida and Cayuga lords, for their decision. When the younger brothers reach a unanimous decision, they pass it back to the Mohawk lords. 
The Mohawk lords report the decisions of the elder and younger brothers, which might not be the same, to the Onondaga. If both the elder and younger brothers' decisions agree, the Onondaga will review the decision to ensure it does not violate the great law. If it doesn't, they confirm the decision and report their confirmation to the Mohawk lords, who announce the final decision to the Open Council. If the Onondaga reject the unanimous decision of the elder and younger brothers, which can happen if the Onondaga believe the decision is against the great law, the process repeats. If both sets of brothers again agree on the matter, the Onondaga veto is overridden and the measure passes. If the decisions of the elder brothers and the younger brothers differ, the Onondaga lords will break the tie with the decision of their own. In those cases where the lords believe the nations at large need a say in the matter, the decision process is postponed, the lords take the issue back to their clans, the clans vote on the matter, and the voting includes men and women. Council lord tenures are indefinite but a lord can be removed from office if the men or women of his clan believe he is not acting in the interest of the clan or nation. Removal proceedings are taken before the Grand Council for discussion and deliberation. It's easy to see why many tend to believe that this was a model for the creation of the U.S. government. It enables cooperation between independent nations with a largely democratic approach. Many arguments circulate to try to prove overwhelming Iroquois influence on the founding of the United States. Still, there's no documentary evidence that the founders considered the great laws, the great law, when writing the founding documents. However, there is strong circumstantial evidence for at least some influence. The, uh, this evidence consists of a letter, a speech, and a process as old as the first human civilizations. First, the letter. In 1751, Franklin wrote a letter to printer James Parker, in which he appears to relate his frustration with the inability of the colonies to unite to work for the common good. The crucial text, taken out of context, is, It would be a very strange thing if six nations of ignorant savages should be capable of forming a scheme for such a union, and be able to execute it in such a manner as that it has subsisted ages, and appears indissoluble, and yet that a like union should be impracticable for ten or a dozen English colonies, to whom it is more necessary and must be advantageous, and who cannot be supposed to want an equal understanding of their interests. First, note that Franklin calls the Iroquois ignorant savages. This seems to contradict the assertions that Franklin had a great respect for the Six Nations and their democratic government. When placed back into the context of the overall letter, the entire statement comments on how strange it is that a group of savages can put together a government, but the civilized colonials can't. It's not necessarily a recommendation to adopt the Iroquois form of government. Still, three years later, Franklin submitted a document to create a united 13 colonies similar to the Six-Nation Confederation. The second piece of evidence used by the influence supporters is a part of a speech given by Kanasatego, an Iroquois representative at the 1744 Treaty Council in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. The following is as quoted by Levy. Our wise forefathers established union and amity between the five nations. This has made us formidable. This has given us great weight and authority with our neighboring nations. We are a powerful confederacy, and by your observing the same methods our wise forefathers have taken, you will acquire fresh strength and power. Therefore, whatever befalls you, never fall out with one another. This is also rarely placed into context. Canasatego, who was often in incorrectly described as a chief or great council lord, was a negotiator. He often worked with the colonies to forge collaboration for defense and other measures, but it was challenging to get all the colonies to agree on something. 
making multiple meetings and agreements necessary. Canasatego was asking the Colonials to get it together, to unite in some way that would simplify the negotiation processes and strengthen the colonial defensive capabilities. The Treaty at Lancaster is one example of what Canasatego faced when dealing with the colonies. The treaty meeting was to help ensure the Six Nations did not side with the French in future hostilities. Canasatego suggested that the colonies unite in the manner of the Iroquois League to better defend themselves and come to the aid of the Iroquois if needed. Again, this was likely a comment born of frustration at the inability of the colonies to come together as one. While Franklin's letter and Canasatego's speech do not prove that the founders copied the Iroquois Confederation, they do show that knowledge of the Iroquois form of democracy was known to the colonists. They also share that it's quite possible that this knowledge had some influence, consciously or unconsciously, on the founders when they wrote the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution. This is even more plausible when we consider the effects of the always possible cultural syncretism. Syncretism occurs when two or more cultures meet and begin sharing beliefs, customs, language, religion, and other information, which can result in changes in each culture. Examples of this go back to the beginning of Western civilization. The Sumerians, a a collection of cities with the same language and culture at the southern part of Mesopotamia, created a great civilization, which included writing. When the Akkadians came from northern Mesopotamia and conquered the Sumerians, they adopted much of the culture of the more advanced Sumerian people. Successive takeovers by other peoples mixed cultures and spread them to the eastern Mediterranean, reaching as far as Greece. Greek culture during the Hellenistic period, the period following the death of Alexander the Great, spread across the Mediterranean basin, with existing cultures adopting what was useful and possibly better than their own. These and many smaller examples throughout history show that cultures tend to borrow from other cultures. However, borrowing usually moves from the culture seen as more sophisticated and civilized to the one that is seen as less sophisticated and civilized. The direction of borrowing is not a written rule. There's no syncretism handbook. It's likely that the human tendency to borrow what is needed extends to more civilized people, people who take what they need from what they consider a less advanced culture when faced with a unique challenge. A challenge such as creating a state consisting of other independent states. What is needed, however, might only be parts of selected practices and not an entire form of government. The first document considered when looking at the effects of the great law on the U.S. Constitution is usually the Albany Plan of Union. Benjamin Franklin drafted this plan in 1754 and submitted it to the Albany Congress or Conference for review and approval. The conference was held from June 19th to July 11th and was attended by delegates from seven colonies, Connecticut, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island. The purpose of the conference was to work out plans for a joint colonial defense during the French and Indian War, known in Europe as the Seven Years' War, and ensure the loyalty of the Iroquois Confederacy. In these early phases of the war, the Confederacy was waffling between the French and the British. The Albany Plan would create a loose confederation, governed by a Grand Council, that essentially left the colonies to govern themselves. The two areas in which the colonies would always defer to the Council included the common defense and treating with the Native Americans. I compared the Albany Plan to the Great Law. You can download the results from the link in the video description. Clearly, Franklin largely borrowed from what he knew about the Iroquois government, while adding and modifying where needed to allow for taxes, raising and paying a military, and ensuring lawful dealings with the king. I found seven significant similarities between the Albany Plan and the Great Plan of Peace, 
or the great law of peace. The ruling body of Franklin's Confederation would be called the Grand Council. The Iroquois called their governing body the Grand Council. Like the member nations of the Iroquois Confederation, the colonial governments would continue to govern themselves as independent entities, having only to conform to limited decisions on trade and war made by the council. Each colony's elected assembly was to appoint a certain number of members to the council. While the Iroquois did this based on the number of clans in a nation, the Albany Plan based the number on the amount of money each colony contributed to the treasury. As in the Great Law, the plan specified how to replace members of the council who died or resigned. However, there was no provision made for removing members for misconduct. The Colonial Council would meet at least annually. Still, it could be called by the President General, an appointee of the King, for emergencies and if approved by seven members of the Council. The Onondaga could call a meeting when needed if its lords agreed that it was required. The Colonial Council would choose a Speaker, who would serve for six weeks. The Great Law specifies the selection of a speaker by the Grand Council, who will serve for a day. And finally, the Albany Plan set out the process with which military officers would be appointed by the colonies, a process not too different from the one used by the Iroquois to enable the clans to select war chiefs. As you can see, the general form of the proposed colonial confederation has several similarities to the Iroquois confederation. While not an exact copy, the probability is high that Franklin used his knowledge of the great law to put together his Albany plan. The conference approved the plan, but the confederation proposal died when the king and the colonial assemblies refused to approve it. The king did not want to share authority, and the assemblies did not want to give up any amount of sovereignty. Many have said that Franklin and the other founders could not have used the Great Law as a model because it was not written down until well into the 19th century. I don't think this would have prevented Franklin from knowing the workings of the Iroquois government, giving his frequent, frequent contact with its representatives for government and personal business. When the Con Continental Congress decided to unify the colonies with Articles of Confederation, there was less attention to the Great Law. While some parts were possibly copied from the Six Nations, there are also strong alternative influences. Article 2 of the, Confeder of the Articles states that each state shall retain its sovereignty, freedom, and independence, which is not expressly delegated to Congress. This is similar to the Great Law, but there's an alternative influence. The colonies were adamant about not giving up their sovereignty. Any confederation document would have likely provided this state independence. Article 5. For the more convenient management of the general interests of the United States, delegates shall be annually appointed in such manner as the legislature of each state shall direct to meet in Congress on the first Monday in November, and in every year, with the power reserved to each state to recall its delegates, or any of them, at any time within the year, and to send others in their stead for the remainder of the year. This article goes on to describe that each state shall only have one vote, and the terms of office mirror the Albany Plan. Further, the number of delegates to Congress, from two to seven, mirrors the Albany Plan. The article adds an additional requirement that no member of Congress shall be impeded from attending congressional meetings except for certain types of felonies. This article, like the Albany Plan's description of membership in the Grand Council, is similar to the Great Law. However, it has had differences. As we'll see when examining the Constitution, the founding documents begin to deviate from the core Albany plan and the six-nation government. Article 6. This article goes far beyond the war powers limitations in the Great Law and the Albany plan, mainly containing nothing in common with them. Any parallels are likely unintentional because any country's central government 
would adopt centralized control of treaties and the right to declare and wage war, which is what is covered in Article 6. Article 7. When land forces are raised by any state for the common defense, all officers of or under the rank of colonel shall be appointed by the legislature of each state, respectively by whom such forces shall be raised, or in such manner as such state shall direct, and all vacancies shall be filled up by the state which first made appointment. Like the Albany plan, this is similar to the right of each of the six nations to appoint their own war chiefs, except that it appears that the Congress or the Grand Council of the Confederation will retain the right to appoint the high-ranking officers or the generals. But an alternative explanation for this article might be the continued protection of state rights the ability to appoint their own leadership over their troops. This leadership would have some responsibility to the state assembly that appointed them. Article 9. The United States and Congress assembled shall also be the last resort on appeal in all disputes and differences now subsisting, or that hereafter may arise between two or more states concerning boundary, jurisdiction, or any other cause whatever. This is similar to the main purpose of the Grand Council, promoting harmony among the six nations. But again, any centralized government, one intended to create a league of states working closely together, would opt for a similar clause. These are the only reasonable parallels I could find between the Articles of Confederation and the Great Law. In my opinion, claiming other similarities would be a stretch with too many alternative explanations. Note that few similarities exist than existed between the Albany Plan and the Six Nations configuration. Further, the articles address trade, judicial proceedings, and other matters not addressed in the Great Law, and over which the Six Nation Grand Council has no explicit authority. Again, the content of this U.S. founding document is much broader than the Great Law, and is far from being simply a copy of either it or the Albany Plan. By the time the Constitution was written, the states and the Confederation leadership had gained experience running a democratic government, a confederation. As shown in the Federalist Papers, they understood what was needed and what had been lacking in the Articles of Confederation. Consequently, the content of the Constitution is far removed from the Articles, and certainly has very little in common with the Albany Plan or the Six Nation Great Law. We need to address a common list of perceived parallels between the Constitution and the Great Law. These similarities appear to be very weak or non-existent. Still, they are often promoted as proof by the Iroquois influence thesis supporters. After I walk through them, I leave it to you to decide on the strength of the similarities. Before continuing, it's essential to note that no personal logs, notes, letters, or other documentation make any mention of the Great Law, the Iroquois government, or any other Native American approaches to nation rule. The following list contains features of the Great Law that proponents of the Iroquois influence thesis believe significantly influenced the writers of the Constitution. No person can hold more than one office in the Confederacy. Note the two decision bodies exist. A body that breaks a tie between the two deciding bodies. A body that determines whether or not a decision complies with the great law. A body with veto power. A citizenship process. Only the Grand Council can declare war. Freedom of religion. Treaties must be approved by the Grand Council. Penalties are provided for treason, and a process for removal of Grand Council Lords. Let's look at each of these. Article 1, Section 6 of the U.S. Constitution reads, No senator or representative shall, during the time for which he was elected, be appointed to any civil office under the authority of the United States, which shall have been created, or the emoluments, whereof shall have been increased during such time, 
and no person holding any office under the United States shall be a member of either house during this continuance in office. In examining the great law, I saw nothing that resembles this. If I missed it, please let me know in the comments. The great law does specify that a lord can no longer serve if he assumes an, outside, an office outside the confederation, but that's a different restriction. This clause in the Constitution appears to prevent conflicts of interest between legislatures and other bureaucratic or leadership positions. Avoiding conflict of interest is always a consideration when setting up a government, a business, or any other type of organization. The founders could have come up with this by themselves without external influence. The Grand Council actually has three decision bodies, the Onondaga, the Elder Brothers, and the Younger Brothers. Their operation is different from the Houses of Congress established in the Constitution. In Congress, both houses must vote in favor of a bill before it moves to the next phase. In the Grand Council, the elder and younger brothers can disagree, but the decision still moves to the Onondaga. The Onondaga can vote to break the tie. We have nothing like this in the Constitution. Also, the Congress has two houses in their current form for a reason not addressed by any current or past governmental forms. Helping to reach equal participation of each state regardless of size. The smaller states were hesitant to sign on to any constitution whereby the nation would be controlled by a legislature with representation based only on population. The Senate was a compromise, with two members from each state, regardless of size. Is it plausible that the writers copied and modified the Iroquois decision-making process? Again, of course, but with no evidence that they did, and with alternative explanations for a bicameral legislature, determining probability is highly subjective. Within the Six Nations, the Onondaga could push back on a decision if they believed it failed to comply with the Great Law. However, they could be overridden if both the elder and younger brothers voted to pass it anyway. In the U.S. form of government, the United States Supreme Court applies checks, to legislation approved by the legislative and executive branches if constitutionality is in question. However, this function of the court is not written into the Constitution. Instead, it's based on the Supreme Court decision Marbury v. Madison from 1803. The court ruled that Article 6 of the Constitution made the Constitution the supreme law of the land and that no acts of Congress could violate it. So, is it plausible that this was copied from the Great Law? Not really. We can draw a closer parallel with veto power. The Onondaga could push back on an issue decided in the same way by both the elder and younger brothers, and the veto could be overridden by both elder and younger groups passing it again. However, the Mohawk could veto any decision. For example, if the elder brothers vote differently than the younger brothers, and the Onondaga then side with the younger brothers, the Mohawk could, can, veto the decision. In the U.S. Constitution, the President can veto a decision made by both houses of Congress, a veto that can be overridden by a two-thirds majority vote in each house. The veto power was part of an effort to ensure that no one branch of government had too much power. It's plausible to see the great law's influence in this, but John Locke's second treatise on government could also have caused the writers to devise a way to check each branch. The proponents of the Iroquois influence thesis would argue that Locke and other European philosophers and enlightened thinkers were also influenced by the Iroquois. This is plausible, given the writings in Europe about Native American freedoms. However, there is no solid documentary evidence that Locke or others copied the ideas of the Iroquois or other Native American nations, so we're back to working with probabilities instead of certainties. The Great Law provides for bestowing citizenship on those not born into one of the nations of the Confederacy, in a clearly defined process. However, the Constitution leaves it up to Congress. In Article 1, Section 8, Clause 4, 
to determine how U.S. citizenship can be acquired. And I quote, The Congress shall have the power to establish an uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States, end quote. Congress passed the first of several naturalization laws in 1790 that had little resemblance to the Great Law, in which it reads, Any alien, being a free white person, who shall have resided within the limits and under the jurisdiction of the United States for the term of two years, may be admitted to become a citizen thereof, on application to any common law court of record in any one of the states, wherein he shall have resided for the term of one year at least, and making proof to the satisfaction of such court that he is a person of good character, and taking the oath or affirmation prescribed by law to support the Constitution of the United States. The Great Law reads, Should any member of the five nations, a family or person belonging to a foreign nation, submit a proposal for adoption into a clan of one of the five nations, he or they shall furnish a string of shells, a span in length, as a pledge to the clan into which he or they wish to be adopted. The lords of the nations shall then consider their proposal and submit a decision. Yes, the requirements and processes for U.S. naturalization change significantly over time. Still, the initial naturalization requirement was far different from that of the Iroquois Confederation. Further, any nation must have a naturalization process, so just the presence of such processes in both the Great Law and the Constitution does not show copying or influence. As to declaring war, the Great Law is unclear on this point. It reads, When the Confederate Council of the five nations has for its object the establishment of the great peace among the people of an outside nation, and that nation refuses to accept the great peace, then by such refusal they bring a declaration of war upon themselves from the five nations. Then shall the five nations seek to establish the great peace by a conquest of the rebellious nation. The Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11, is more specific about who can declare war. And I quote, The Congress shall have the power to declare war, grant letters of mark and reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water. It's not clear who in the six nations can declare war. Uh, it's probably the Council. However, it's, a, it's probable that precedents had been set, precedents known to the founders because of continuing negotiations for peace in collaboration in wartime. Regardless of how it was done by the Iroquois, the founders' great fear of any one person gaining too much power would likely have given the right to wage war to the body most closely controlled by the states and their citizens. The states were not going to give up their voice in decisions whether or not to wage war. So while plausible, we once again have a subjective probability that the founders were heavily influenced by Native American governance. The First Amendment to the Constitution guarantees freedom of religion by prohibiting a state-required religion. I quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, end quote. The great law reads, The rites and festivals of each nation shall remain undisturbed and shall continue as before, because they were given by the people of old times as useful and necessary for the good of men. These are the same in meaning that the central government shall not impose any religious beliefs on the states or nations and shall not interfere with current belief systems. While it's plausible that the founders were strongly influenced by the Six Nations, there's another explanation. Throughout the history of the colonies, continuous controversies over religion existed. Some colonies and communities resorted to casting out those who didn't believe what they believed. At the time of the writing of the Constitution, religious controversies were still strong and would be for decades, while some colonies having adopted a particular Christian sect as official within its borders. 
The founders knew that attempts to impose a single religion across the colonial populations would fracture any union. In addition, the freedom to practice religion without government control was still a crucial contributor to why colonists crossed the Atlantic. Consequently, it is reasonable to believe that this amendment would have existed with or without external influences. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on treaties. Both the Great Law and the Constitution delegate treaty approvals to the legislative bodies. However, Grand Council approval requires an affirmative vote by two of the three bodies. Only the Senate approves a U.S. treaty. Again, the influence is plausible, but establishing a probability level is a proverbial stab in the dark. The Constitution addresses treason in Article 3, Section 3, Clauses 1 and 2. I quote, Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them, or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. No person shall be convicted of treason unless on testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act or on confession in open court. The Congress shall have power to declare the punishment of treason. End quote. Punishment for treason was not clearly defined for decades after the Constitution was written. It is now part of Title 18 of the U.S. Criminal Code. Since the definition is based on the British Treason Act, 1351, and because U.S. jurisprudence relies heavily on common law, it's likely that early penalties were determined based on court precedents, which included the death penalty. According to the Great Law, I quote, if a nation, part of a nation, or more than one nation within the five nations, should in any way endeavor to destroy the great peace by neglect or violating its laws and resolve to dissolve the confederacy, such a nation or such nations shall be deemed guilty of treason and called enemies of the confederacy and the great peace. It shall then be the duty of the lords of the confederacy who remain faithful to resolve to warn the offending people. If they, they shall be warned once, and if a second warning is necessary, they shall be driven from the territory of the Confederacy by the war chiefs and his men. Unquote. The Great Law is a much different approach to finding and managing treason. Further, any nation involved in wars, and any nation with enemies, must have some way of dealing with treason. The probability of heavy influence in this case is relatively low. Article 1, Section 2, Clauses 5 and 6 specify how to remove the President or a Supreme Court Justice. I quote, The House of Representatives shall choose their Speaker and other officers and shall have the sole power of impeachment. End quote. Article 1, Section 3, Clause 6 reads, uh, the Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments. When sitting for that purpose, they shall be on oath or affirmation. When the President of the United States is tried, the Chief Justice shall preside, and no person shall be convicted without the concurrence of two-thirds of the members present. Article 1, Section 5, Clause 2 specifies that Congress can expel one of its members. Still, like the impeachment process, it leaves it up to each house to determine the process. The clause reads, Each house may determine the rules of its proceedings, punish its members for disorderly behavior, and, with the concurrence of two-thirds, expel a member. The Great Law specifies a process that begins in the relevant nation and is taken to the Grand Council for deliberation. I quote, if at any time it shall be manifest that a Confederate Lord has not in mind the welfare of the people, or disobeys the rules of this great law, the men or women of the Confederacy, or both jointly, shall come to the council and upbraid the erring Lord through his war chief. If the complaint of the people through the war chief is not heeded the first time, it shall be uttered again, and then if no attention is given a third complaint and a warning shall be given. If the Lord is contumacious, the matter shall go to the council of war chiefs. The war chiefs shall then divest the erring Lord of his title by order of the women 
in whom the titleship is vested. When the Lord is deposed, the women shall notify the Confederate Lords through their war chief, and the Confederate Lord shall sanction the act. The women will then select another of their sons as a candidate, and the Lord shall elect him. Then shall the chosen one be installed by the installation ceremony. End quote. There is very little in common between these two approaches, given that no process is addressed in the Constitution. It's unlikely that the founders would have ignored the possibility of having to remove a president, member of Congress, or a Supreme Court justice. So this final claimed influence is plausible, but unlikely. It's clear that the founders looked to the great law when first trying to determine the best approach for a states within a state government. It's also clear, however, that over time they came up with what they believed was a better way, a way that considerably expanded beyond anything contained in the great law of peace. The Iroquois influence on Franklin's Albany plan of union is apparent, but similarities between the great law and the U.S. founding documents become less apparent when compared to the Articles of Confederation, almost entirely disappearing when compared to the Constitution. When we only look at the common list of similarities between the Great Law and the Constitution, as promulgated by the supporters of the Iroquois influence thesis, the probability of a strong Native American influence on our form of government appears high. However, when looking at the details, when comparing the relevant clauses in each document, the probabilities precipitously drop, severely weakening the Iroquois influence thesis. Well, that's it for this video. As you can see, the topics we'll discuss in this channel will analyze both ancient and current beliefs. There's no correct answer for most of what we cover when we do this. Instead, we explore and come to tentative conclusions based on what we learn while being open to changing our beliefs when additional information becomes available. Please subscribe if you learned something or were challenged by what I covered in this video. If you want to be able to engage in in-depth discussions about the video topics and download the guides associated with the videos, while also supporting the production of these videos, please become a member of my Patreon page. Until next time, keep an open mind.